desperate crew of a doomed generation ship must fend off some extremely nasty stowaways. In the Scourge Between Stars, that's the book I'm reviewing on this episode of SFF 180. Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to SFF 180. Thomas here, your host as always. And yeah, I'm still here, still in Austin. Uh, my last night in Austin, I've come back to the uh, Buzz Mill uh, for uh, some awesome looking pizza and uh, a nice pint. Although uh, this is this is called uh, Devil's Backbone, and it's all right, but it's uh, I was hoping it would be a really nice smooth ale, but it's kind of a, a hoppy IPA, which is a little disappointing. So um, anyway, it's a bit more crowded, like I said, uh, than it was the other night. I think uh, over on the other side there, they've got an open mic comedy night going on god help us uh, so I've, I've had to tuck myself back here in the corner uh, you may hear some uh, <laughs> cheering off to the side there and uh, hopefully not too much in the way of copyrighted music so that I can uh, monetize this video but otherwise I'm happy to be here I'm having a great time so please sit back enjoy while I review a book for you I'll take a bite of this first mm. 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 Generation ships have been a popular science fiction trope for a very long time, but would you really want to live on one, you know, to spend your entire life in the confines of a single vessel, never knowing anyone outside of your crew, never knowing if your descendants will make it to your ultimate destination, let alone establish a successful and thriving colony? Well, if Ness Brown does anything with indisputable success in her debut short novel, The Scourge Between Stars, she will cure you of any romantic notions you may have about venturing into deep space aboard a generation ship. Now, when we meet the crew of the Calypso, we know already from the start that they're pretty much doomed. The Calypso is part of a massive flotilla of generation ships fleeing a climate-ravaged Earth for the promise of a fresh start in a colony on Proxima B. But the colony has proven to be a complete failure. Now the ships are limping back to a home that they know is also unlivable. And if all that wasn't bad enough, someone or something has been attacking them. The ship has taken severe damage from what the crew calls engagements, sudden random barrages that impact the vessel without warning. No one knows where they come from. No one even knows if they're intentionally targeting the Calypso or if the ship has just haplessly blundered into the middle of somebody else's interstellar war. But lives have been lost, food stores are depleting too rapidly, and morale has hit rock bottom on the verge of full mutiny. All of this, naturally, is weighing very heavily on Jacqueline Albright, the Calypso's acting captain. Now, her father, the real captain, has locked himself in his quarters and hasn't come out or made any attempt to communicate with Jack or anyone else in the crew for a solid week. Ness Brown roots her story in Jack's character, who is so convincingly written that the sympathy we feel for her, and by extension, everyone else on the ship, helps to kind of smooth over the story's over-reliance on recycled ideas borrowed from the Alien franchise. Jacqueline is exhausted, grieving both a lost sister and mother, angry with her father's dereliction of duty, nearly overwhelmed with imposter syndrome and trying to fill his role, and yet always, always doing her absolute best to project authority and confidence towards a crew in need of strong leadership. Now, it's a tribute to Brown's skill at character development that nothing about Jack feels forced or contrived, that every emotion feels genuine. Bombarded by unknown alien hostiles, not enough food to last the crew of 6,000 for the trip home, people splitting into factions and rioting. Could anything get worse? Of course it could. Now it looks like the Calypso picked up some stowaways and several hungry xenomorphs have been hiding out deep in the lower decks and crawling around inside the bulkheads. And now they're coming out, mercilessly savaging the crew. Contact with other ships in the fleet have been lost, except for scattered, panicked transmissions, making it horrifyingly clear that the entire fleet is infested and that no one is a match for these beasts. So yeah, it is all kind of an alien redo from here on in, but Brown knows what she's all about, and honestly, 
If I can't begrudge multiple generations of epic fantasy writers taking cues from Tolkien, I'm certainly not going to hold it against the author of a Monsters on My Spaceship story for wanting to recreate the visceral thrills of the most beloved space monster stories of our age. So we see a lot here that is familiar to us from the alien universe. There is the android who's a little bit sus, who we cannot initially be certain is friend or foe. Uh, there's the one crewman who's gone completely nuts and thinks that the monsters are a good thing. Uh, there is a fantastically executed scene in which Jack and a heavily armed security detail ventures into darkened decks to seal them off and flush the monsters out. We've seen it before, but Ness Brown still gives all of it solid entertainment value. Less commendable is the choice Brown makes, and I will try to spoil as little as I can here, in the denouement which takes a major plot point and uh, turns it into a deus ex machina that lets her cheat the science to save the day. Now, I won't deny that I sincerely felt these characters, after everything that they endure over 160 pages of this story, have definitely earned a happy ending, but what we get feels far too convenient. Indeed, it's a solution that could have been figured out very early in the story, other than at the tail end. Still, if all you're in the mood for is some enjoyably diverting deep space action horror, The Scourge Between Stars might just be the thing to grab you in its claws. Okay, everyone, there you have it. <laughs> That's all I've got time for on this episode of SFF 180. Remember the most important things, just like pizza, these are reviews. You're not going to like what I like. You're not always going to agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF and horror reading friends, and above all, please subscribe if you have not done so. That is what helps the channel to grow. Wow, <laughs> making a huge mess. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon, where I read Coots into Week's Army. Occasionally, you get little perks like uh, early access to some of my videos, but Mostly, what the patron is for is to help me pay Matt Olson, my extremely gifted and talented channel artist. I want to thank all of those folks for their additional support. It is extremely appreciated. I want to thank all the rest of you guys for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube. And until I see all of you next time, back in my studio, without a pizza and a beer in hand, unfortunately, still, stay safe, stay healthy, and happy reading.